It's January 9th, 1806, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. Today in history in 1806, thousands of people lined London's freezing streets to witness the funeral of the British naval commander Horatio Nelson. But one of the most surprising faces in the crowd that day was that of the French admiral Pierre-Charles Villeneuve, the man in command of the French and the Spanish fleets that were defeated by Nelson at the Battle of Trafalgar. And because Villeneuve had been captured in the battle and presumably because he had nothing better to do while on parole in Britain, he decided to show up to what turned out to be one of the greatest displays of public mourning in British history. Yeah, the fervid anticipation was unlike anything London had ever seen. Some modern commentators have compared it to the aftermath of Princess Diana's death. Mm. And a big reason for that is that it took two months from news of the death reaching Britain for the body to actually arrive, which let the outpouring of emotion build to fever pitch. You know, people were writing odes to Nelson in the press. People were following the process of the body back to Britain. It seems weird, but there was hype for this funeral. Yes. And I mean, hype that was actually politically calculated as well, it's worth saying, because, you know, wars at sea with the French continued for another decade. And it was important for the government to use this victory that Nelson had had at Trafalgar as propaganda. You know, let's let's venerate our fallen hero. I mean, how often does it happen, actually, that the person you're venerating as your fallen hero also died amidst a great victory. Mm. I mean, one of the peculiar things about Nelson's death is that he actually learned of the victory that Britain had had in the Battle of Trafalgar just before he expired, and so did the whole country. They're like, wow, we won won a battle. Oh, but he's dead. Oh, that's sad. So you had both things happening at once. What does that mean for our national character? What does it mean for this great hero who's fallen? So you can see how these things coalesced into this absolutely enormous state funeral. Yeah, and as you say, the government was really keen to harness and exploit this public mood that had been created and to divert attention from, you know, its apparent impotence against Napoleon's all-conquering armies in the first place, but also from the then Prime Minister William Pitt, who, just exhausted by the war and drinking very heavily, had only days to live. He actually died aged 46 on the 23rd of January. So, you know, Nelson, who was this popular son of a Norfolk parson, was given this full state funeral and, in fact, the first non-royal recipient of such an honour. So Nelson had actually only fairly recently become a household name. This was after his famous victory at the Battle of the Nile in 1798, during which he effectively neutralised the entire French fleet in a nighttime attack. But it was the Battle of Trafalgar, you know, obviously, in which he died, that made him into this superhero in the British imagination. And, and part of the reason for this hysteria was the breaking of the tension. You know, For years, Britain was in genuine fear of invasion by Napoleon. It always seemed like he was just on the precipice of doing it. Napoleon also being at the peak of his powers, you know, and this out at Trafalgar was like a huge sigh of relief because even though, as you said, Britain would go on to fight more battles with Napoleon over the years to come, many saw Nelson as the man who had stood between Britain and Napoleon's forces at this crucial moment. And that legend was further bolstered by the almost cinematic circumstances of the battle and of his death. You know, you've got his pre-battle rallying cry, England expects every man will do his duty. You've got kiss me hardy, you know, as he's dying. and all those, the hits. Yeah, all the hits. And those touching final words, supposedly he said, God and my country. So all of this coming back to Britain, you know, via letter, then being printed in the newspapers, all while the body is being slowly brought back to the country. He framed his own death very conveniently for becoming a national hero. Well, I think he framed his own mythos throughout his career. And that's not to say that he wasn't a superb sea officer. Just the look, and again, not to say that he deliberately did this, but, you know, he lost his right arm in heroic action as Spanish musket ball hit him in a battle at Tenerife and it had to be amputated. That was one of the less glorious battles. People basically saying, what was Britain doing there? But he managed to come out of it with this injury which changed the way he looked. And then, as you say, when he had this first truly decisive victory against the French in the Battle of the Nile, that triumph was celebrated all across Britain with things like ribbons and pipes and domestic furnishings, even to the extent that you can see in his correspondence with his lover, Lady Hamilton... Um, that she is wearing his commemorative merch. Quote, my dress from head to foot is a la Nelson. Even my shawl is in blue with gold anchors all over. My earrings are Nelson's anchors. In short, we are benelsoned all over. (laughs) 
his affair with Emma, Lady Hamilton, the wife of the British ambassador at Naples, was a relationship that came about due to his ever-growing fame after the Battle of the Nile. And also the relationship was then picked up by the papers and added this extra element of, I don't know, titillating gloss to his uh, like already extraordinary naval achievements. But also that famous phrase that he has, kiss me hardy, uh, at the, towards the very end of his life. There's late a scholarship that's gone on that has sort of suggested that maybe that was a mishearing of what he was saying. And one of the suggestions is that instead he uh, was saying kiss Emma Hardy, which sort of seems maybe more likely. There was another interpretation that got popular in kind of the late Victorian era, which was that he was saying kismet Hardy, i.e., you know, accepting his fate or destiny. But many contemporary historians have already debunked that because, you know, the word didn't exist. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't being used in that way. Victorians really didn't want him to be kissing Hardy. (laughs) If it was a mishearing, then it was a very embarrassing one for Hardy because he did kiss him. (laughs) I mean, I suspect that he'd been consulted on what should happen in the event of his death because it wasn't exactly entirely unexpected, was it? You know, this was a huge battle, the Battle of Trafalgar. Um, He wrote in advance of it that it is annihilation that the country wants and not merely a splendid victory. In the hours before the two forces met, he spent some of his time writing an amendment to his will to provide for Lady Hamilton. Mm. And also, before he was hit by a a sniper's bullet, um, he got dressed up in his full military regalia. Which, of course, I mean, he would be wearing anyway as the commander, but at the same time, you kind of think... (laughs) Sweats. (laughs) That's for downstairs. (laughs) But... (laughs) <laughs> you wouldn't necessarily have to wear all of the ceremonial medals because that is kind of like a big target for a marksman, isn't it? Like a load of jewels all over yeah. you. But he did. And so there's a feeling that maybe, I mean, again, it's a theory, but maybe he knew that he was likely to be killed and that this would be his big victory. Yeah, and he I, I have to say, he made his funeral preferences more well-known than most through his life. The mahogany coffin in which he lay in state at Greenwich Hospital was made, per his request, from the master of Lorient, the French flagship he destroyed at the Battle of the Nile. It actually weighed a ton, like an actual ton. And he'd already said, that's what I want to lie in state in. And at the Battle of Cape St. Vincent in 1797, he famously shouted, Westminster Abbey or glorious victory. This was in reference to the fact that national heroes were buried at Westminster Abbey. Although in the actual event of his death, they didn't have room for any more heroes at the time. So he was interred, you know, second class at St. Paul's Cathedral. (laughs) Well, the way that he got there is also quite spectacular because after he had uh, lain in state, his body was then taken up the Thames and then he spent the night before the funeral at the Admiralty. And the next day, he was placed into a funeral car that was modelled on the Victory. It just, (laughs) it is a bit sort of comedic almost because there's this carriage that also looks like a mini boat and that was then taken through the streets to St Paul's and there Sir Peter Parker, Admiral of the Fleet and no relation to Spider-Man he led the mourners and members of the Victory's crew in the procession and there was one moment that was really kind of the, the one moment of, I don't know, just real non-choreographed grief which was when a group of seamen who presumably were a bit grogged up at the time uh, ripped apart a union flag and each kind of wanted to take a piece of it home and that union flag has subsequently hit auction sites and now bits of it go for immense sums. Yeah, it's a bit bizarre that so that was a flag taken from Victory the ship that was supposed to be the final, that was yeah. supposed to be the, the cumulative part of the, the funeral, was that he'd get buried in the flag yeah. from victory. Why would they do that? I guess it was a moment for people that had actually served with Nelson mm. and for the, those, that lower class of body of people to actually have their moment during the funeral because it was really an event that was attended by all the VIPs in London. The actual procession itself it included 32 admirals. There was an escort of 8,000 soldiers as well. And as well as crew members from the Victory, there was a vast parade of aristocrats. If you look at the listing of who was in it, it was basically every member mm. of the gentry in the entire country had their own morning coach. And actually so intense was the feeling that the Prince of Wales had wanted to break with royal protocol and act as the chief mourner himself. He eventually decided not to. And you kind of think, was it the royal family trying to cash in a little mm. bit on all of the you know positive emotion around yeah. Nelson but either way the vast majority of people in the procession were aristocrats who probably didn't know Nelson at all 
Yeah, also, he had a slight reputation as a bit of a sex god, I think, as well. He was having an, a high-profile affair, and one contemporary chronicler writing about the thousands thronging the banks of the Thames the day before today in history wrote, quote, The decks, yards, rigging and masts of the numerous ships on the river were all crowded with spectators. The number of ladies was immense. <laughs> Hmm. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Why would you mention particularly <laughs> that there are a lot of ladies? You can sort of imagine them all with their kind of anchor earrings on. You know, <laughs> all of his slogans and everything had been reprinted onto stuff to be sold on the streets, England expects and all that stuff. And there was a sense that he represented not just the best of British, but specifically the best of a kind of British masculinity. Do you reckon the Kiss Me Hardy t-shirt sold particularly well that day? <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow. You had to be up at, like, four in the morning to watch a maths lecture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors.